section 1.4, exponential functions. First, we have some loss of exponents. If a and b are positive numbers and x and y are any real numbers, then b to the x plus y is b to the x times b to the y. So when we uh, multiply bases, we add their exponents. Similarly, when we divide bases, we subtract their exponents. Uh, for a third law, if we have uh, a base to uh, an exponent and we raise that to an exponent, then we multiply their exponents. And if we have two numbers and we raise them to an exponent, then that's the same as raising each of the numbers to the exponent individually. So as an example, let's sketch the graph of the function y equals 3 minus 2 to the x. Let's start with the graph of y equals 2 to the x. So. Here's our x-axis, our y-axis, and when uh, x is 0, that's 2 to the 0 is 1, so we can start at 1, and then as x is 1, it becomes 2, as x is 2, it becomes 4, as x is 3, it becomes 8, so it grows very quickly. So we could start at 1, growing very quickly. If we make x into negative numbers, then we start getting fractions, like 2 to the minus 1 is a half, 2 to the minus 2 is a fourth, so it gets very small in the other direction. So let's say that this is 1 over here, that's 0, and then this is the graph of y equals 2 to the x. If we want the graph of y equals minus 2 to the x, then all we have to do is flip this thing upside down. So this would be at minus 1 now. And that's y equals 2. Sorry. That's y equals minus 2 to the x. OK, finally, we want to make this into y equals 3 minus 2 to the x. So we should add 3 to this. So we should just move up 3. OK, so instead of starting at minus 1 when x is 0, we should start at 2 because that's 3 above. So that could be 2. So then if you notice, there's this line over here and over here, the x-axis, that our exponential function never passes. So that line also moves up by 3. So now this line that we never pass is y equals 3. OK, so this is y equals 3 minus 2 to the x. And it should make sense that there's a line that the exponential function can never pass because there's no exponent you could possibly give 2 to the x to uh, make it ever have a negative y value. Any exponent you give it will still preserve and make it positive. Even if you give it a negative exponent, all it does is just make it into a fraction. So when we flip this and move it up by 3 units, there's still a line that it never crosses. It just gets moved up. On the other hand, we can plug in any x value we want, so the domain is every single real number because we can plug in anything but like we said our range is restricted it stops at three so it's all of the numbers up until three okay example two let's use a graphing calculator to compare the exponential function f of x equals two to the x and the power function g of x equals x squared and let's see which function grows more quickly when x is large so let's pull out our handy dandy calculator emulator, go to y equals, we'll put in 2 to the x, enter, and x squared. So 2 to the x will be blue, and x squared will be red. Hit graph. OK, it's kind of hard to see, so we should probably zoom in a little bit. So we'll hit zoom, and then number 2 to zoom in. Let's move my cursor to around over here. This is where it looks like one of them is like outstripping the other. Ooh, it's hard to get right there. Let's see. OK, good. So we can see that the blue function, which remember was our exponential function, does get bigger than the uh, quadratic function, the power function. 
but it takes a little bit of time. But we're only thinking about this when x is large, so when x is large, we can see that it's going to consistently be more. It just takes a little bit of time for it to cross, but it won't cross a second time, as we saw when we zoomed out. Okay, so let's go back. Our exponential function. And exponential functions usually outstrip uh, other functions, but especially uh, a power function, but it usually takes a little bit of time. Okay, the half-life of strontium-90 is 25 years. This means that half of any given quantity of strontium-90 will disintegrate in 25 years. So if we have a sample of strontium-90 and it has a mass of 24 milligrams, let's find an expression for the mass, m of t, that will remain after t years. So first let's look at m of zero, right? At the start, we haven't even started disintegrating yet. So we're at 24 milligrams. That's after zero years. After 25 years, we should have half as much because we were told the half-life is 25 years. So we'll have half of 24. I'm not going to simplify that yet because we're going to see if we can find some sort of pattern so that we can come up with an expression for the mass in general. So let's look for m of 50 now. We keep going by this uh, half-life because that's how much, th th those are all the quantities we know. We know that we don't know how much might be in between, but we always know that every 25 years there'll be half as much, so it'll be half of half of 24, which is the same as 1 over 2 squared times 24. If we go another half-life, we can look at m of 75, which will be half of m of 50. So it's half of 1 over 2 squared times 24, which is 1 over 2 cubed times 24. M of 100, same thing, half of M75. So it's half of 1 over 2 cubed. So it's 1 over 2 to the fourth times 24. Okay, I think that's enough for us to see that there's a pattern here. It looks like we can relate uh, the exponent to t somehow. Everything else will be the same. The 24 is the same every time, the 2 is the same every time. The only thing changing is that exponent. So if I look at this, I can see 4 relates to 100 the same way that 3 relates to 75, the same way that 2 relates to 50. Well, that's just dividing by 25, right? 50 divided by 25 gives us the exponent 2, 75 divided by 25 gives us the exponent 3, etc. So I think we have enough. We can write m of t equals 1 over 2 to the t divided by 25. t is 100, divided by 25, I get 4. Oh, can't forget to multiply by 24 though. Okay, we can simplify that a little bit. We get 24 times 2 to the minus t over 25. And I don't know if that's really simplifying, but it expresses it more clearly as an exponential function. We could even pull out the t if we want. So if we do that, we get 2 to the minus 1 over 25 to the t. Let's see if we could find the mass remaining after 40 years, correct to the nearest milligram. So that would be m of 40. Okay, using our formula, it's 24 times 2. Instead of to the minus t over 25, it's minus 40 over 25. And we can use the calculator to see that that's approximately 7.9 milligrams. I think we we're supposed to go to the nearest milligram though. So I should just say it's approximately eight milligrams. Okay, so let's use a graphing calculator now to estimate the time required for the mass to reduce to five milligrams. 
So we'll get back our calculator. We have to go to y equals again. We're going to plug in our formula for m of t. So 24 uh, times 2 to the minus, and it use x instead of t, x over 25. That looks good. Let's clear our x squared so it doesn't get in the way. And let's go to zoom so that I get a nice standard view. Wow, we don't even see it. Let's zoom out. Ah, there it is. Okay, we want to know when this thing's reduced to 5 milligrams. So let's also graph y equals 5 and see where they intersect. Okay, so they intersect a little bit off screen, so let's zoom out a little bit more. Okay. To find their intersection, how about we try to zoom in over there. Okay. And let's go to second trace to so get the calc menu. We'll go to five, which is intersect. Our first curve would be our exponential curve. Our second one is our y equals five curve, five milligrams. And we're gonna guess that it happens around there. Okay, it looks like our intersection is when x is 56.5. Seven. Okay, so that's like uh, 57 years. So I'll write m of t equals 5 when t is approximately 57 years. Okay, we call the function f of x equals e to the x, the natural exponential function, where e is the value of b and y equals b to the x, resulting in a tangent line at 0, 1 with slope 1. So what that means is that we want to find some sort of function, an exponential function, that if we were to graph it, oops, and we were to look at that point zero one and look at the tangent line, which we haven't even defined yet, then this tangent line should have slope one. Okay, so later on we're gonna actually determine this uh, function that gets us this objective and we're gonna even talk about why we even want that but for now, we just have this definition that this particular function that happens to have a tangent line with slope 1 is e to the x. And we call it the natural exponential function. e is about uh, 2.71828. That just happens to be the number that works. And we'll determine how we can arrive at that number later on. For now, we're just basically uh, teasing ourselves. So. Looking at the graph, this guy is y equals e to the x. If we want the graph of y equals half e to the minus x minus 1, then first let's look at what the graph of e to the minus x would look like. That would just be flipping left right because x is being multiplied by the negative. So over here is still 1. That's e to the minus x. Now let's uh, multiply by half. We're getting closer and closer. 
So all this does is make it uh, grow more quickly. Oh, I'm sorry, it makes it grow more slowly because I'm multiplying by half. So we should get a slightly wider looking function. Okay, so this is one now. Now it intersects at a half instead of intersecting at one because we multiplied by a half. So all of those y values got smushed. And that means that we can wrap up by just subtracting one. So if that's zero, we subtract one, so it end up, ends up intersecting at uh, minus a half now, instead of intersecting up, at a, instead of intersecting here at a half, it intersects down here at minus a half, because we moved it down one. So that's y equals half e minus x minus one. And in order to figure out the domain and range, we should figure out what numbers it can't get past. Originally, it couldn't get past this x-axis, which was the same for e to the minus x. Then it ended up still being the same for half e to the minus x. It doesn't change where it can't get past. Uh, but when we move it down one, that moves that line down one. So now instead of it being the x-axis at y equals zero, it's this line at y equals minus one. So our domain, as usual for most of our exponential functions, is all real numbers. Because we can plug in any x value we want, but our range stops at minus one. So it's only the numbers from minus one to infinity. Okay, let's use a graphing device to find the values of x for which e to the x is greater than a million. Get back our calculator. We will go to y equals. We'll plug in e to the x. Clear our y2 equals 5. For the zoom, we will get a nice uh, standard display. There's our nice graph e to the x. We want this thing to be greater than a million. So we need to plot a million. 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, 1 million. Obviously we can't see it because we're only going up to about 10. So our window doesn't contain it. Let's see if we can make it fit. Okay, let's zoom out a little bit more. Mm, perfect. So let's see where that point of intersection is. Second calc intersect. First curve. Second curve. And we'll guess. Okay, looks about 13.8 for that x, right? So let's go back. And say e to the x will be greater than a million. Let's see if I can write the correct number of zeros. Maybe. When x is greater than 